Welcome to the CAM Lecture Series, our kickoff for this fall semester. Dr. Linda Abraham Silver is our guest for the evening. The CAM Lecture Series is made possible through the, generous, uh, gen the generosity of Carl CAM, the late Carl CAM, uh, who developed uh, or, or established this endowed lecture series for the benefit of the business division at Baldwin Wallace University. So we have an insightful lecture this evening. It's about one woman's leadership journey through science museums and now helping a government transform a society from an oil-based society to a science-based society. So I'm, I'm really excited also to be talking to someone, interviewing someone who has been quoted in the Wall Street Journal today. How did that happen, Linda? Um, you know, it was serendipity that it ended up happening today, but um, uh, we're getting ready in Abu Dhabi to launch the third annual uh, Abu Dhabi Science Festival. It's a huge uh, community-wide event that we do, and for s some lucky reason, um, our quote ended up in today's journal. So we're, we're ready for that in November. Great. Well, why don't we get started and tell us a little bit about your background, where you grew up, where you went to school. Yeah. Just we'll start from the beginning. Okay. I don't know how interesting this is. Um, <laughs> I hail from California. I grew up in uh, Northern California, just north of San Francisco in the Bay Area, Marin County. Um, and I left Marin to go to university. I did my undergraduate degree at UCLA and I majored in classics. And my parents asked, what would I ever do with a classics degree? And at the time, I really thought I would go into academia. Um, when I was a senior in college, I had an opportunity to go into the field in Greece and do some archaeological work. And that's where I realized that A, archaeological field work was not for me, and B, academia probably wasn't either. But um, as part of that program, I had an opportunity to be in a, a survey course where we looked at different roles that people played within the university campus museum. Um, and I got really interested um, in that and so started looking around to figure out, did I know anybody who was working in the science museum or natural history museum field? And as it turned out, did a little searching, uh, found one woman uh, who I had a connection to who was currently working at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County, just called her up for an informational interview, had that interview, ended up as a university student getting my first job as kind of a weekend job with them, and then parlayed that into what ended up being a 13-year career at the Natural History Museum. Um, so that's, that was a little bit of my background uh, in terms of getting into science museums. Um, when I was at the Natural History Museum, something really interesting happened. It's a 100-year-old it's institution. It's one of the largest research and collections-based uh, institutions in the United States. It rivals the Field Museum, the American Museum of Natural History in New York in terms of collection size. And in my first couple of years there, um, one of the things that really had an impact on me was that um, our, our director retired and the deputy director stepped into the role and during his 12 month or so tenure he embezzled millions of dollars out of the museum and it obviously had profound impacts on us but the first thing that I thought to myself is you know how is it that it wasn't caught and we looked at um, the director who had been there before him and, and the other leaders in the museum world and all of them had phenomenal impeccable credentials in research. They were great paleontologists or herpetologists or ichthyologists and none of them understood the balance sheet and none of them understood the fiscal operations of um, the organization. So it was that incident really that made me think, okay, if I want to lead, if I want to lead, lead in, a, in a museum, it would be a very good thing to take content area expertise which is what I had from the classics and archaeology, and couple that with um, just some foundations in business. So I ended up, while I was working at the Natural History Museum, going uh, to school at night and getting my MBA from Pepperdine University. So I did my undergraduate degree at UCLA and then an MBA at Pepperdine. And then when I finished my MBA, um, that was actually a catalyst to moving into um, one of three uh, vice president roles at the Natural History Museum. Um, which was, which was really quite phenomenal. I, I really enjoyed that. And then I decided um, from then to pursue my PhD. So I continued my studies in the evenings and did a PhD in science education at USC. So I did those degrees while I was working full time, which I think many of you 
are doing as well. Um, and then as soon as I finished the MBA, I had the VP position. And as soon as I finished my PhD coursework, not even my thesis, but my coursework, I had the opportunity to come to Cleveland and to lead the Great Lakes Science Center. Wow. I'll give you, I'll give you that money later for plugging the business program. Yeah, wow. We didn't talk about it. Honestly. I know. I know. This is great. What a great commercial. <laughs> uh, for business education, that's, that's yeah, wonderful. Yeah. Well, there are, there are not enough people who are running cultural organizations and institutions who have business acuity. And it's, it's what you need to make these institutions as successful as they can be. So, I mean, usually you rely on the board for that. And you need to be able, I think, to rely more on the staff. Right. So what was one of your, besides the embezzlement, <laughs> what was one of your biggest challenges while you were there? And how old were you when all this was going on? Yeah. Um, so I started working, um, gosh, while I was still a senior at UCLA, so 21, 22 years old. Um, I was in, I became a VP, um, and this was a fairly large organization in terms of museums. So five museums in a family of museums, about a $35 million a year operation. Um, and again, I became one of three vice presidents in the mission delivery area. So there was research exhibitions and education. I had um, uh, the education, I think I was 27 at that point, and then 34 when I got recruited to be the CEO of uh, Great Lakes Science Center. So I think the board took a little bit of a risk on me <laughs> in terms of age. Yeah. They must have been disappointed when you left. Oh, you know, I, I think so, um, but I hope I accomplished enough while I was there to, to make it worth their while. What would you say was your biggest accomplishment while there? At Great Lakes? At, no, in Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. Um, yeah, it's, uh, well, we grew the education division. So I oversaw education and then what became the front of house. So essentially all of guest relations. Um, and I'd say there's a couple of things. One was finally um, building um, a presence for the education division. I think out of um, the other operational areas, education, and this happens in a lot of organizations, got the least amount of resources and the least amount of attention, um, when in fact, I think we were doing some of the most impactful work, especially with members and visitors and the general public who came. Um, if very few people, it, it's very important to have the collections and the research going on, but that touches very few people. Um, and so the building of the education program, which really came through fundraising and finding a few dedicated, um, frankly, individual donors uh, who wanted to give to the effort um, and allowed us to build um, an outreach program into Los Angeles Unified Schools that was award-winning nationally. So I think that was one of my biggest accomplishments and then, or one that I feel the most proud about. And then um, also the, the operational organization of the front of house. We ended up outsourcing all of our retail and outsourcing all of our F&B, things that we had as an organization for some reason held on to early on, but it didn't necessarily make financial sense. Um, and the rationale was, you know, do we want to spend money and have our employees be experts in retail and F&B? No, we really wanted our um, employees to be experts in the mission delivery of the institution, and we could easily outsource the retail and the food and beverage operations and allow us just to um, collect commission, if you will, off of those operations and not necessarily have to deal with cash flow and inventory and all of those things that can preoccupy you and, and take your attention away from the mission of your organization. Great. So how did you get to Cleveland? <laughs> so I got to Cleveland. Um, the Board of Trustees was looking for a replacement for the original director, director who was retiring. Um, and a headhunting firm found my name somehow, and they interviewed me um, over video conferencing while I was in Los Angeles, and then I was invited out for a, um, an interview here, and it happened so quickly. I think that, um, gosh, I think my first video interview was in March, and my in-person interview was in May, and I was here in July um, in terms of being able to, to run the organization. And, and again, I think, um, you know, the board went to the absolute opposite extreme of my predecessor. So he was a, a lawyer um, in his 60s, um, you know, kind of came from that background, and they went for a 34-year-old girl <laughs> who hadn't done this before. Um, so I think it was pretty brave of them. <laughs> mm -hmm. What do you think was one of your biggest accomplishments? Or At Great Lakes? At Great Lakes. Um, gosh, there are so many things I loved doing there. <laughs> um, 
Uh, let's see. Well, what are you most proud of? I'm most proud of. So to begin with the wind turbine that's on the front of the Great Lakes Science Center. Um, and I, I would say this for all the things I'm really proud of there. I had no idea what I was getting into when I said I would do the project. <laughs> so we decided in conjunction with the Cleveland Foundation, and it was Ron Richard that we were really working with, that um, wind might be one of the new industries or industry verticals for Cleveland to really be focused on. And um, people at the time were really afraid of it. They thought wind turbines were going to be loud, they were going to kill birds, they were going to kill the little brown bat that's protected in this region, um, and it was going to be an eyesore. And so we went ahead and put up um, the wind turbine, not realizing that it was going to be the first installation on the shores of the Great Lakes. So it broke precedent in a number of different ways, and we ended up having to do with a whole lot of different kinds of um, intervention and protocol. We you know, had to work with um, environmental agencies to study the impact on bats, to study the impact on birds. We did all kinds of things that I would have never thought that we were going to have to do in order to go ahead and, and uh, put the wind turbine up. But I think what it did then was catalyze what has become a project on the Great Lakes. And now you see more wind turbines that are up and around. And um, it, you know, the, the turbine itself provides enough energy for the Science Center now to run all the gallery lights. So it's, a, it's like a 6% energy savings. Um, but more importantly, it's about kind of creating this vision and this icon for what was, we hope, or what will be a, a future industry here in Great Lakes. So that's something I'm proud of, um, becoming one of the NASA visitor centers, I think, and being able to take, you know, I don't think a lot of people knew this, but uh, Cleveland had one of only 10 NASA visitor centers in the entire United States. And it was located behind the gates at NASA Glen, which meant that after 9-11, it was incredibly difficult for people to go and visit, whether it was a school group or a family group. Um, and so we worked um, for a number of years with lots of legislators, because this is a, a federally mandated uh, project, to actually physically relocate um, the NASA Glen Visitor Center into the Great Lakes Science Center. So that was something that I'm proud of. And the development of the STEM high school. Um, if you don't know, um, Great Lakes Science Center actually houses uh, Cleveland Metropolitan's STEM High School in on the ground floor. So anybody, any student who's a STEM student spends their entire freshman year in classrooms that we built out uh, in the Science Center. So um, those are three things I'm really, I was pleased with the okay. outcome you, of. You also brought the Great Lakes Science Center out into the public, into the public space. Yeah, I think so. I think, um, you know, I think we'd always been a place that people were excited about and interested in and came to, but I think that we also, um, you know, we hired a whole lot of new staff and really tried to infiltrate the community more and to, to be out more and to be less thinking about, you know, we built it so they will come and more about how do we get out into the community and really um, engage with people and other organizations. What were some of the biggest challenges you faced? at the Science Center. Um, well, the first was actually just really getting on people's radar screens because we had kind of been seen as this, um, you know, self-supporting little organization. We hadn't necessarily, in, in my opinion, been seen on the same level as some of the or other cultural organizations within Cleveland. Um, and so it was kind of building the reputation, I think, of the Science Center and, and bringing us more front and center. And that's all about building your board and building your staff and ensuring that, first and foremost, your financials and your operations are all under control and then being able to kind of build vision on top of that. So. So now, <laughs> your current role, you yeah. are your associate as director. Associate yeah. director. Yeah, I'm associate director of the mm -hmm. Abu Dhabi government's Technology Development Committee. Mm -hmm. Tell us about that. That what, it, how it came about, the creation of it. Sure. So. Um, Abu Dhabi, and this is all on the website, you guys can look it up if you're interested, um, developed an economic vision that they call the Vision 2030, um, which is all about um, building Abu Dhabi's economy into, from an umbrella standpoint, a knowledge-based economy and diversifying the different industry verticals that the economy will um, need to rely on moving forward. Uh, right now, about 60% of the GDP is reliant on oil and gas reserves. Um, and we know that there's something like 200 years of oil and gas reserves left. Um, so I think they're taking a long-term view in terms of what's going to happen once the oil and gas money runs out. But it's interesting, too, because they're, they're thinking um, short-term. I had a, a, one of my earliest meetings was with somebody from the National Oil Company, and he said, you know, the Stone Age did not end because we ran out of stone. And just the same, oil, the oil industry won't 
stop because we run out of oil. It'll be because other innovations come in advance of that. Um, so they have identified um, essentially 11 different industry verticals, oil and gas being one of them, to invest in over the course of uh, the next uh, couple of decades till we get to 2030 with the idea of taking that 60% GDP down to about 35 or 36% GDP in terms of um, oil. So oil uh, production will continue to grow, but as an overall proportion of what is co being contributed to the economy, it's going to be significantly less. Um, and then the other areas that they're looking at are things, uh, or they are actively building, are um, the aviation and aerospace and defense industries, education. I was uh, telling Linda earlier that um, NYU has opened a branch in Abu Dhabi, the Sorbonne has opened a branch in Abu Dhabi, so large scale, um, uh, universities are making a, a, a play for that space. Um, media is uh, another area that they're investing in. If any of you read the book, The Help, and then saw the film, it was produced by Abu Dhabi, uh, which you might not know. Interesting, huh? Um, uh, let's see. Um, biotech, pharmaceuticals is another area. Uh, metals is another area. There, there are quite a few. Um, ICT. Um, another area. So trying to invest in these industries where they think that long term they can have a competitive advantage and develop those over time to offset the, the over-reliance, if you will, on oil and gas. It's, it's a really deep deficit when you look at um, their GDP in terms of non-oil and gas. This is really innovative from a country or government standpoint, wouldn't you agree? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it's certainly um, it, it certainly seems to me it's ambitious to begin with. Um, it is focused on innovation. The country, when you think about it, the UAE is only 40 years old. Maybe it's 42 years old now. <laughs> it was 40 when I went over there. Um, so it's an incredibly young country, um, and it's been able to develop on a scale that is absolutely, I think, unprecedented. For those who may not know, can you mm -hmm. give a brief little overview of the government structure, the royal family, that? Kind of thing. Right, right. So the United Arab Emirates is actually um, comprised of seven different emirates, and each they're all united, and there's one president. Um, the uh, capital, if you will, is in Abu Dhabi, um, but the others all have different ruling families as well. Um, so Abu Dhabi is run by um, uh, his, the Crown Prince uh, Sheikh Mohammed, and um, his family, and and uh, the people that he appoints um, under him, and our board, for example. Uh, TDC is appointed by the Crown Prince Court. Um, and then the other uh, emirates have similar ruling structure, uh, structures in place. So there's a Crown Prince of Dubai and of the different emirates as well. Abu Dhabi is the largest of the emirates in terms of land space. Dubai is the largest in terms of population. Um, but Abu Dhabi has the vast, vast majority of the oil and gas reserves. And so it really is the um, economic engine, if you will, of the, of, of the country. Dubai tends to, has a little bit of oil and gas reserves, but they tend to focus their economy more on um, things like the financial sector, media, those things. So who, who could take the credit for coming up with this idea of this vision? Yeah. You know, I'm, I, I don't know if there's one individual person who necessarily can, but I think that most people would point back to the, um, the founder of the UAE, um, Sheikh Zayed, who is, uh, he passed away some years ago, but he really was the one who um, fought for the development of the country, the independence of the country. Um, it had previously been occupied by the British. Um, and really, uh, he's the one that everybody internally gives credit to. So he would be the father of Sheikh Mohammed, who is our crown prince, and then um, Sheikh Khalifa, who's the president of the overall UAE. And there, I think there are 17 sons, so. That's just two of them. <laughs> so it's really Sheikh Zayed that everybody gives credit to. Okay. Uh, what are the metrics to measure the success of yeah. this plan? Do they have them? They do have them. And um, you know, he, the, if you want to look at it really precisely, there's a web page that does that. But it's really looking at um, economic development, economic diversification, um, uh, and an unemployment rate that's 5% or lower, um, the wellness, well-being, education levels of their citizens long-term, and how active those citizens are in, uh, in the economy. 
Well, how does your project, this science museum project, yeah. fit in yeah. to, the, to the Vision 2030? Well, so TDC has a number of different roles um, that we play in terms of of Vision 2030, um, and mine is one piece of it. Um, the other pieces are uh, really focused on innovation and laws and regulations. So um, TDC developed the first um, patent mining uh, opportunities in the country. There actually wasn't a, a process in place for people who were inventors to patent their ideas. So that's now done through TDC. We actually subsidize the cost of it and we run those patents actually through the US Patent Office. Um, so we're giving people who do want to innovate an opportunity to protect their ideas essentially. And then we have other um, projects that will take those ideas, help those people who've created those ideas, take them and transfer them so that you've got tech transfer and marketability of those things going on. And then we also are the custodian of the five-year STI, Science Technology Innovation Plan. And the piece that I work on is really about human capital development. So I said earlier we've got these 11 industries, oil and gas just being one of them, um, that Abu Dhabi really is going to rely on to be able to reach their vision for 2030. And it's going to require a significant number of um, individuals to run those organizations and to, um, to be the engineers, to be the technologists, to be the scientists who are behind all of that work. Um, and one of the things that they recognize is that when they look at their own populace, um, only about 20% of the kids are choosing a science or technology track in school. So in cycle three, which is like their high school, they have an opportunity to either choose the arts track or the science and technology track, and 80% of them are going the arts track. And then longer term, I don't know, they go into marketing or human resources or, or really kind of support areas, and not enough of them, as many countries um, are facing, are choosing the science track. And so um, our project was really about how do we get more kids long term to be choosing careers in science and technology. So we looked back to what we know in the United States, and there are a couple of things that we know about people who choose careers in science and technology. Um, the first is that the single biggest predictor to choose a career in science and technology is your interest, your curiosity and interest about science between the ages of six years old and 11 years old. So it's not what your grades are, it's not what your parents did, it's not how you do in school that is the single biggest predictor, it's your interest. And so building on that, um, we developed a number of different platforms to help spur that curiosity, if you will, among kids who are 6 to 11, and actually we've gone kind of 5 to 15, um, and developed a number of different platforms that will help interest them, we hope, in science. And the first um, that was mentioned earlier in the Wall Street Journal today is the Abu Dhabi Science Festival, which is a 10-day festival that we hold every year that has, um, it's, I think it's become the world's largest in three years, um, hosts um, workshops and shows and um, demonstrations, science demonstrations essentially, um, and invites the public in. Um, in year one, I think we had 100,000 visitors. In year two, it was 120,000 visitors, so huge numbers. Um, and that was really kind of the proving ground for, for the next couple of projects that followed, which is, one, which is kids there, just like any place else in the world, love science if it's presented in a fun and hands-on and exciting way. So we've got the festival going. And then this last April, we launched, taking what worked really well in the festival, we launched a science outreach program into the schools. So we also take some of these ideas into school classrooms um, and, and present them essentially there, really with two ideas. One is to get the kids interested, and two is to model some of best practices in terms of science teaching and pedagogy to the to the teachers who are um, in those schools. And then the last is the Science um, Center, which is a longer term project because of course we're, we have to build that. Um, and so we'll look to that being opened at 20, end of 2016. And what's that going to look like? Have, has that final plan been made? Yes, but it hasn't been announced. Okay. <laughs> we'll be uh. through with detailed design uh, in, at the end of December. So we'll know what the building looks like at the end of December. Um, I know what every, all 214 exhibitions will look like and what the galleries that house them will look like, but um, we'll, we'll be able to share actual okay. renderings and pictures and details about that later this year. Can you tell us, is it going to be open to all ages? Absolutely. Okay. I mean, like 
like any good science center, it's got to be able to engage an entire family. So kids who are very young and kids who are coming with um, older siblings, we will focus, and most of our education programs will focus on that target 6 to 11 because that's the point, right? Mm -hmm. It's to get those kids interested. But of course, it'll be, you know, much like the Great Lakes Science Center here, something that's a family experience. Okay. What are your observations about the uh, Emirati's progress on the other initiatives? So, so um, yeah, I don't have personal insight other than living there and seeing what's reported on a regular basis, but it's moving really, really quickly. So I mentioned aerospace and aeronautics as being um, one of the areas that they're focused on. In the last year, they've uh, launched their first two satellites into space. So those were built in um, Abu Dhabi, launched, and um, are now communication satellites for them. So they're moving very, very quickly and putting the resources um, really behind it. Um, I, and I see evidence of it on all 11 fronts. How did you come to uh, take this position? Can you tell us? Yeah, you know, it's always who you know, right? <laughs> um, gosh, I, the Science Center world is small. The museum world is small. The Science Center world is smaller. And um, there just happened to be some people who were working in Abu Dhabi who knew me from my work first in Los Angeles and then in Cleveland. And when um, TDC decided that this was one of the projects that they wanted to do, they were talking to people. And my name came up. And um, they asked to talk to me. And that's how it went. <laughs> and you moved your whole family. Tell us about I that did. experience. I did, yeah. So um, I'm married and I have two children. My daughter's 13 and my son is 10. Um, so I up and moved them uh, from first from Los Angeles to Cleveland and then Cleveland um, to Abu Dhabi. And um, we also moved our two Great Danes. It was harder to move the Great Danes than the children. <laughs> and it was more expensive, too. Um, yeah, so at this point, my children go to the American Community School, which is in Abu Dhabi. Um, my son, because he's in elementary school, he's required to take Arabic every day, which is great. He's just blah, 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 blah. Um, my daughter's in middle school, so she got to choose, and she's taken French, but that's fine. Um, but so far, they're having a great, a great time. They... Um, you know, they meet kids from all over the world. I was telling Linda earlier, uh, in a few hours, my daughter gets on a plane. Her eighth grade field trip is a week in Thailand this year. Last year, seventh grade was a week in Turkey. They're, they're, so they're having these really amazing experiences. And um, it's an incredibly safe place, too. So it's, um, you know, I can drop her off at the mall and frankly leave her there and feel absolutely perfectly safe and fine. There's very, very little. Um, crime or violence, you certainly don't see it. Um, so yeah, they're having a good time. And my husband has always been a full-time stay-at-home father, so he's easily transportable. <laughs> what are the cultural differences that you've experienced? At, in oh, there's so many. Um, gosh, where do we start? <laughs> um, well, it's, uh, I mean, to begin with, it's an Islamic country. And so religion, the law is a religious law. Um, that's followed. Um, but it's a very, very open society in the UAE. And so I'm not in any way required to cover my hair or, or cover my body. I mean, I'm certainly um, respectful of, of their culture. So it's, I wouldn't wear something that was offensive, essentially, to them. Um, but it's, it's a very open society. But it's still um, very, very family-based. Um, again, because the country's only 40 years old, um, there's a lot of, of history that's still part of these families. So women my age in the UAE, I won't tell you how old I am, but um, were married at 12 and had their first, children, first child at 13. So we're just one generation um, kind of away from that. Um, but it's been a tremendous, I think, change because those kids who are now in their 20s, essentially, vast majority of them, especially the, the boys, went to school in the UK or the US and had those opportunities. So they're importing a lot of, I think, Western um, ideas and kind of cultural norms, um, but still be, being able to hold um, their history themselves. They're, they all dress in national dress. So the men are wear the white Kandora gowns and the gutras and the either white or red and white checked um, uh, head pieces. And the women all wear an abaya, which is essentially a black, very elegant black flowing robe and a shayla, which is a head covering. Uh, very few people in the UAE cover their faces fully. And they can't at work. That's a mandate. You can't work for the government and cover your face. So um, they can cover their hair. Um, 
uh, yeah, and the only time I have to wear one is if I were to visit a mosque. Um, you know, and some of the, the, the Grand Mosque is a beautiful cultural icon, and so if I do that, I go there. But I tell you, there are some days I wish I wore that because you know they're all wearing yoga pants to work. <sighs> and I think to myself, oh, so well, nice. so there's a difference, but is there a difference between your being an expat? They mm -hmm. refer to you as an expat, mm -hmm. sure. and the women in the uh, UAE and, and how they're born and raised there, how are they treated in the workplace versus you? You know, I, I, honestly, I don't see a difference between the way that we're, um, that we're treated. Um, it is really interesting. So the, the women in the UAE, and I think a lot of the Middle Eastern countries, tend to be more highly educated than the men, more successful in school, than the men, um, often more successful in the workplace uh, than the men. This is just what I've seen, and I can back up a little bit about it. Um, it's, it's really, really interesting. So um, if you look at things like the PISA scores, the international um, assessment scores in math and science and reading, which is done worldwide, the UAE is one of, I think, three countries where the women outscore the men in every subject. I mean, women always outscore the men in reading, and usually the men in European countries or uh, North America outscore the women in science and um, sometimes in math, although it's less significant difference in math. There, there's a statistically significant difference in the women outscoring the men on every single vertical that's, that's, um, that's measured there. And then um, for the last couple of years, I've also done a lot of research at the festival that we do, I, where I'm interviewing um, young boys and girls, both Emirati and non-Emirati. Um, and unlike Europe and North America, what you find is significantly greater confidence levels in the girls. So they're much more confident in their abilities in math and science. Um, and they're much more willing to say that science and, and math are fun or interesting um, than the boys are. So it's, you know, you almost worry about what's going to happen to these boys um, when they grow up. <laughs> have less why, opportunity. Why do you think that is? Where did they get their confidence? You know, if their mothers had children at 13. Yeah, and some of them, yeah, certainly did. Um, I don't know if it's an, if it's an interest in um, proving themselves or it's, they recognize that they're the first generation to have these kinds of opportunities and they're going to take advantage of it. Um, or if it's just, I don't know if it's the nature of women. <laughs> well, what's been the role of the government in uh -huh. educating women? So all boys and girls are educated. There are, um, the government schools are separated, so you have boys schools and girls schools, um, but there's not a differentiation in terms of the quality of education, and there's a significant number of private schools, both um, co-ed and non-co-ed as well. Um, but the government supports um, education at, at a very high degree. Um, some of the challenge has been getting enough teachers who are proficient in English because math and science uh, is taught in English and because they recognize that to be able to be successful in university, students need to be conversant and be able to read and write in English. Um, that's been one of the challenges and so a lot of um, uh, teachers are imported. There's a tremendous number of expat teachers who are in um, in the schools, both government and private there, um, but the government supports all the way through university, including sending um, Emirati students to the U.S. and the U.K. and funding um, that education for them. And more boys will go abroad for school than girls. More of the girls will stay um, in Abu Dhabi or in the Emirates to go to school. So the stereotype of the perceived disempowerment of women in the mm -hmm. Middle East, is that is that just a yeah, misconception? You know, <laughs> I, on a day-to-day -day basis, it seems to be a, a misconception because um, I certainly work with extremely strong, extremely independent, extremely um, capable women. Um, men too, but the women tend to be uh, almost more ambitious, frankly, um, than a lot of the guys. Um, but you still don't see the same number of women in um, you know, cabinetry roles, for example, or on boards. Um, one of the big challenges that the UAE has is that the um, Emirati population is much more interested in working for the government than working in private industry. And we know that if these industry verticals are going to work, it's going to rely on private industry. Um, the problem is that it is so lucrative to work for the government 
the, the private industry can't match that. And so, you know, if you work for the government, you're going to make more money, you're going to get more days off, you're going to have shorter working hours. Um, and one of the problems that I see in terms of um, the women is that they're almost disincentivized to work by a couple of policies, which were, I think, very well-meaning. So if you're a female and you work for the government, you can retire with full benefits after 15 years. So at 36, you can retire for the rest of your life. Now, what's the incentive <laughs> not to do that? And many women will, and then they'll start, um, you know, they'll open a boutique with a friend, or they'll open a cafe, or they'll become a small business owner, which is also a very good thing. But it doesn't incentivize you to stay in the workforce. Um, it, it's a much longer time period that you have to work if you're a male. Uh, and then if you work for the federal government, you have to work for God 20 years <laughs> before you can retire. Um, so there are some of these things that um, make it, I, I think, make that transition from, you know, government-based to private industry-based that's going to be difficult. Wow. Let's shift to leadership. Okay. What's your philosophy about oh, leading an organization? <laughs> mm. Well, if you're going to lead an organization, you're really leading people, right? Whether it's your board or it's your staff. Um, and I would say early on, I think, and because I think I had to do this first at you know, early age, 26, 27 years old, I really thought it was about knowing the right answer and telling people what that right answer was and getting them to actually you know, move in the direction that you thought they needed to move. And more and more, it's just the, you know, I have, uh, I'd rather just hire the people and let them, let them lead um, and be there to support and to provide vision. Um, but I'm so done with telling people what to do. And it's really just about getting the right capable people in the right positions and then letting them do what they need to. So would you say your leadership has evolved, your style, your Oh yeah, I wouldn't skills. want to work for me when I was 26. <laughs> Not now. <laughs> um, yeah, and I think it's it's part of what you kind of learn over time. And you know, you're in your first management role or your first leadership role. You don't want to, you know, you want to do it well. You want to do a good job, and you think you have to kind of have tight reins, maybe, um, to begin with. And then I think as you get older, like me, you just realize that um, less of that is a good thing. I, I think you're right about that. You <laughs> you felt you always had to have the answer. Yeah, and if you didn't have the answer, yeah. you weren't the leader. Right. So. Right. Um. And I will also say, it's you know, because I know that you wanted to talk a little bit about um, gender and gender bias, and I would tell you, I, I think there I've had more of it of a gender bias in the U.S. and not from men. I think more of the bias or what I felt has come more from women, um, and it's I think it's just maybe it's the generation that I was in. Um, the women that I worked for were women who I think you know were the ones who had to eat nails for breakfast to make it to where they were and it was almost as though they wouldn't I, I wouldn't be successful or they wouldn't think I was successful unless I went through the same kind of hell that they did to make it there um, so really interesting I think I've learned more about what not to do from some of the female bosses I've had then I've learned what to do. What about your female peers and your male peers? How was that? Would you see any bias there? Um, yeah, because I can know, tell you stories from the law. I'll, that I'll tell you. I think women are much harder on each other. It's harder. I, I feel terrible saying this. Harder to work with women and for women sometimes if you're a woman. Except us. Except us. <laughs> That's the truth. Truth. So, and it's interesting because now I'm trying, I, I'm mentoring a lot of women who are um, junior in their roles in Abu Dhabi and trying to, you know, it, their first inclination too is if they get a manager title is to be the manager and trying to understand that you can, you can step back from that. So it's, it's sort of human nature, would you say, that when you're younger, you might want to, f you, you want to prove yourself? Yeah, I think you do want to prove yourself. Um, and you, you know, you've been given a title and you want to live up to that title. And you have certain um, a mindset or expectation about what's expected of you um, to live up to. So 
so do you enjoy mentoring the women in uh, Abu Dhabi? In Abu Dhabi, I, I yeah. really, really enjoy it. I've never done any kind of formal mentoring um, uh, in the U.S. Um, and I think, I, I think of trying to be a role model or helping people, encouraging them. Um, but I, haven't never, I have never done a, a formal mentoring program. The women that are working with me in um, Abu Dhabi, it's really interesting because many of them now have to travel with me. And um, some of them had never traveled um, alone before. If they had traveled, it had been with their father or their husband, um, which means they'd never checked in themselves at an airline. They'd never, you know, done anything without having been directed um, to do that through passport control and, and checking into a hotel and those kinds of things. And so um, they've had to learn that as we go along. And it's been interesting to see um, some of these women kind of just come out of their shells and realize they're completely capable of doing all of this stuff themselves. But doesn't so that, that goes to their culture, right? That goes to their culture, yeah, yeah, yeah. and to protective families. Yeah. How about the men in the society and dealing with an expat woman uh, working in the role that you have, for instance? Yeah, Can so, you talk about that? Mm -hmm, sure. Um, for the most part, all of the men that I've worked with um, have been extremely um, respectful. Um, there are some who are uh, very strict in that they won't shake my hand, you know, or, uh, you know, touch me accidentally in any way. Um, and it's just, a, it's just a matter of respect. Um, they wouldn't do that for any women, whether they're Emirati or expat. Um, and for the most part, I think, um, you know, they recognize that the people who are there who aren't from there are doing their best to help advance their country and the initiatives that we've got there. Um, I, but I, Really, I've worked with older individuals and very young individuals, and I really haven't felt any kind of a bias at all. And again, so many of these people have, frankly, went to school in the States or in Europe or in the UK, and so they've, um, the boys in particular, and so they've had the experience of being out of the country and seeing, you know, more of a Western campus. What's been the biggest challenge uh, living uh, in Abu Dhabi, oh. and you know, if it's personal, professional, what do you think the biggest challenge has been for you? Yeah, um, gosh, you know, well, getting my children over and acclimated, and the family acclimated, of course, is always um, something that's a challenge, um, but it was a good challenge. Um, I think because we're government, uh, the bureaucracy is the same in every government, right? It takes so much longer to get things done than you want and that you know could we you know things could get done more quickly. Um, so you've got this layer of bureaucracy and then you've also got a layer of you know needing approvals um, for especially for certain high level projects at a level where you're not going to get attention like that. And so things take a little bit longer and I think that's probably been more of the frustrating piece of the bigger challenge. So as you look to the future and after the science museum <laughs> opens, what are your plans? You know, I don't know. I don't have my next plan. Um, oh, sorry. Uh, uh, written out yet. I've done a little bit of um, uh, work in the region um, because science and technology is something that the entire Gulf is looking at um, developing. So there could be other projects that are there. Um, it's a real challenge to think about coming back um, to the States because it's so easy to live there. I mean, I fill up my SUV for $27. And um, you know, from empty to full, um, and uh, gosh, we have access to absolutely everything. Um, so it's, you know, and medical is 100% free, and everything is covered. And um, so it, it'll be, and you know, there's no taxes. Um, there's is that <laughs> because you work for the government that the medical is 100%? You know, uh, uh, yeah. If I were working for a private industry, there would probably be um, some kind of a copay. But there's national health care, and so um, yeah, it's absolutely fabulous. And then the government charges absolutely no taxes. So there's no sales tax. There's no income tax. As a U.S. citizen, I have to pay income tax, but a for, you know a large portion of that is. Um, not taxed, so uh, I don't know. <laughs> wow. Well, I've asked enough questions, and I'm sure there's questions from the audience. So could I have the first question, sir? I'm uh, very curious about your daughter ah. being very safe when you leave her somewhere. Mm -hmm. 
you know, I think Detroit and Cleveland could they eliminate crime would be much further ahead. Yeah. And I just wonder what what is the secret of eliminating crime over there that gives you such confidence in the safety of your children? Yeah, that's a really good question. And you know what I should also say? So my daughter went to an all-girls school in Cleveland, and she had to move to the Middle East to go to a co-ed school. It's very interesting. <laughs> it's kind of this flip-flop. Um, you know, it's, well, if you're an expat living there, and expats in Abu Dhabi um, make up 80% of the population, and in the overall Emirates make up 85% of the population, if you do anything wrong, you're out of there. You're deported immediately. I mean, if you um, get angry while, uh, this has happened while I've been there, um, somebody getting angry while they're driving and giving a symbol to the other driver, you get deported. That is impolite and it's not acceptable. And it's reason to get you out of the country. So there's very little tolerance for incivility. Um, and then just culturally, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a, a, a country where people are extremely generous and, um, I mean, every day I walk by Ferraris where the keys are left in and the car is running, but nobody would take it. I leave my purse out everywhere. It's just, it's, it, I don't know how they've done it except to, you know, that if you do something wrong and you're an expat, you're out of there. And even if you're not, there are, it's not Saudi Arabia, but there are, are harsh penalties um, for doing bad things. Okay. Question <laughs> way in the back. Hi, um, my name is Sunny. I'm a um, sustainability agent here on campus. Yeah. And I was just wondering with the new museum that you were talking about, how much was sustainability taken into account for building that? So it hasn't been built yet. Um, and it, it is absolutely taken into um, uh, account. Um, the, I don't know, if you're a sustainability major, you might know about, and if you don't, you should look at Mazdar City. So Mazdar City is the energy city in Abu Dhabi. And it was developed by Lord Norman Foster. There's a, the Mazdar Institute is there. It's um, the development of all advanced energies because solar and wind and all of those are being developed there. Um, we're, we'll actually be um, on that campus. So as a building on that campus, we are held to um, a certain standard, much like LEED is here, it's called something different there, that will require a minimum threshold in terms of um, water, energy consumption, um, et cetera. So it's absolutely um, a requirement for us. And it should be. Yeah. But you should visit Mazdar campus. So I moved in January 11, so almost three years. Yeah, so almost three years. Science festival. So I got there in January of 11, and we had the first science festival in October of 2011. So yeah, pretty quick. Or was it November? I can't remember. It was, maybe it was November, then October, then now we're back to November, yeah. <laughs> so, and, and the festival, you can look online. Um, there's a great website. One of the things that I think that we've done that that no one else in the world has done, which is really interesting, is the science there is facilitated by university students. So this year we recruited 850, 900 university students and trained them to be the science communicators to deliver the science to the kids. And the majority of those students are Emirati students, so they're having their role modeling uh, for the kids in their own um, country, and they're learning about science communication te uh, techniques as well. So that's a cool thing. More questions? Yes. Um, you were saying that they um, don't do taxes there. Do, how, do, how does the government get money? Do they tax corporations? or? So there's some um, what are called offsets to different corporations, which you could look at as a tax. It's money that an, a corporation who goes in and gets a contract needs to be able to give, and it's used for infrastructure, building infrastructure in the country. Um, but otherwise, the, o the oil and gas revenues are where um, the country gets its revenues from. So yeah, I mean, it's amazing. When you buy a car, there's no sales tax. When you buy anything in a store, there's no sales tax. Um, there's no income tax on their uh, citizens or on any of the expats as well, yeah. I don't know how long they'll be able to keep it up for, but yeah. <laughs> it's a real advantage to being there. Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Um, on that, on that same note, um, 
since so much of their infrastructure is funded through gas and oil revenues, uh -huh. as they move their economy away from the dominance of that industry, mm -hmm. is there concern amongst uh, the, the citizens of the country with regards to how viable that level of service Government service is going to be. continue to be. Um, so the idea is not to lower what they're getting out of oil and gas. It's to increase the other industries. So that what they're looking at is actually um, a growth in the economy of about seven to seven and a half percent every year up until 2030. So by those standards, it shouldn't that shouldn't be an issue. Again, in Abu Dhabi, there may be 475,000 Emiratis. It's a tiny population. Um, and besides oil and gas, they've then taken the revenues from that and have one of the world's largest sovereign wealth funds, and they invest that very wisely. <laughs> so, mm -hmm. How easy is it for you to move, um, to travel in between the different countries? Um, I, Emirates? I, obviously, you mentioned your daughter, but, yeah. but I'm, I'm wondering in terms of uh, safety and mobility. Super and when easy. when you're working, your husband might want to take the kids on holiday. Yeah, yeah. So we do all of that. Um, we can drive from all of the Emirates. We can drive into the different um, Gulf countries. If we want to drive to Oman or um, Kuwait or Bahrain, we could do that very easily. Um, there's also a lot of air transportation that goes. So, so we have visited, um, you know, Jordan and Oman and Kuwait and uh, Qatar, um, you know, all within, I don't know, 50 minutes to a three hour flight, super easy. The only place that um, we couldn't go at the moment uh, in the Gulf is Saudi Arabia. You need an invitation uh, to be able to enter that country. And as a woman, I could not enter Saudi Arabia without the permission of my husband or my father. So, and actually one of the things that, it, it, there aren't many women like me who have a stay-at-home husband. Um, and when I did move over there, one of the really interesting things was that I had to get a, he had to write me a letter of no objection. <laughs> he didn't object <laughs> to me. Um, having a job and uh, being the visa holder for our children. He thought that was hysterical. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, but otherwise, travel is super easy and, and fairly inexpensive and um, safe. totally safe. I feel, I'm sorry to say, I feel so much safer there um, because they, I mean, well, they partner with Lockheed. Lockheed provides, I think, $300 million worth of defense a year um, to the area. Um, we are, when you look at um, the Emirates, the northernmost Emirate, which is Ras al Khaimah, it's only 25 miles between Ras al Khaimah's coast and Iran. So you are close there. But um, I, honestly, I feel, I, I feel so much safer there than in most of the United States. I had a question. Uh -huh. with. Um, with building these different pillars in the economy, uh -huh. um, I don't know exactly how built up the country is at this point, but are they looking at s sort of like a holistic land use and urban planning type thing to be able to build these and be able to keep them sustainable, especially if the population continues to grow? Yeah, um, so the different emirates, I don't think it's done as a countrywide, it's really done by the different emirates, and the two emirates that you're really looking at are Dubai and Abu Dhabi. Um, and I don't know if the statistic is correct, but I heard recently that half the cranes in the world are actually in the UAE because the building is just tremendous. Um, so they do have some very strict guidelines that they try to go by in terms of things like you know water usage and energy usage. But the fact of the matter is energy is incredibly cheap there. Um, and so there is probably less incentive um, than in other parts of the world where that don't that lack those natural resources, um, but they, but they they um, they are very serious about what the equivalent to their lead essentially in terms of um, impact on the environment, if you will. Mm. We go there. We'll go there. <laughs> yeah, well, uh, great, I shouldn't point. <laughs> uh, oh, it's just I, a conversation. <laughs> just had a. Uh, oh, thank you. I just had a question uh, regarding your comment about um, the interest in STEM for six yeah. to 11 year olds. Uh -huh. um, I found it very intriguing. I actually direct a, uh, a youth STEM program here in the city. 
Good. And um, so obviously exposure and awareness is critical. Mm -hmm. uh, but one of the things that I run, in, run into often is that if the students don't have the requisite skill set, mm -hmm. Uh, where do you see that playing a part? Uh, because we do have a lot of students that have the interest, right. but maybe not the foundation for success that we see later on. Do you just have any comments on how we can maybe overcome that? Yeah, absolutely. And, and that really is about um, teachers and teacher professional development. Um, I think, I mean, science centers, um, it's where a vast amount of this learning actually happens. Um, but you do have to have the teachers who are properly trained. and. Um, especially in the United States, when you look at teachers of elementary school science, for the most part, they have no background in science, and for the most part, they're scared to teach science because they don't have um, the content area background to, to fall back on. Um, so I think um, it's got to be backed up by better teacher professional development and preparation of teachers to teach science. So just uh, when you see that, that disparity um, in the mm -hmm. UAE of yeah. the 80-20, do you think that's the same reasoning or is it different? I think it's a couple of different things. I absolutely think science is taught in a way that's very boring and static and we hear that from the kids that we interview. To them, science is a test and a textbook. They have very little access to kind of hands-on science and things that promote innovative thinking. Um, and so that's what we try to do with, with the programs that we've got. Longer term, when the Science Center is developed, we'll also have teacher professional development that will help those teachers take informal techniques and, and put them into the classroom. So I think that that's one of it, uh, one of the reasons. And the other reason is, it's, I mean, I think arts education is incredibly important too, but it's less rigorous the way that it's curr currently um, taught. And so we need to up-level the rigor of that curriculum as well so that there's less of an imbalance. That's just what I think. Yeah, and if you want to look at, since you're in, in science education, if you want to look at the, the research studies, it was um, TAI, T-A-I, who did all the um, research on um, interest in students 6 to 11 translating into long-term careers. Yep. Yeah. Uh, one thing Oh, yes. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So, it, um, well, I'm still an American. <laughs> but um, so the Cle yeah, I'm a convert. Um, so the Cleveland Clinic actually operates the Sheikh Khalifa Medical Center now. It is walking distance from my house. I can walk out my front door and walk one block to it. Um, but they're in the midst of finishing the building of what will, I understand, be the first seven-star hospital in the world, which is right on um, one of the uh, Maria, Maria Island, which is right downtown. I mean, it's directly across from the Abu Dhabi Mall, and it's going up now. I do not know when they actually plan to open it. Jan Murphy yes. would. Um, yeah, a friend of ours is, is going over there to... Chief of Staff or...? Uh, CEO. CEO, okay. Um, so the Cleveland Clinic ha already has a major uh, presence. Um, and we'll have a much larger presence um, moving forward. So I'm sure that there are all kinds of employment opportunities through the Cleveland Clinic as well in terms of once that's opened, um, needing to staff it um, the same way you'd staff a hospital here. It's not just doctors that you need. You need everything that's going on. And I know some people who are currently at the clinic interviewing for positions to come over um, to Abu Dhabi. Um, and then, I mean, so you guys are, are business school students, and one of the things that um, I always knew that I wanted to live and work outside the United States at some point in my life, um, and I would encourage any of you to do the same thing. It's Even if it's only for a couple of years, even if you get a contract for two years or three years, um, to live outside of the U.S. and to to meet people from all over the world and to be able to bring that experience back, I think it's just been absolutely invaluable. And um, I, I, whether it's an exchange program, um, uh, which I think can be beneficial as well, um, or actually working outside the country, I think you just, you learn a lot about, um, about how other people view the United States and you learn a lot about another, another country as well. So it just gives you this perspective that I think is different. And I would highly encourage all of you to think about it. 
<laughs> yep. Is there a um, religious tolerance in different uh, denominations and stuff besides Islam there? Yeah, absolutely, especially in, um, in uh, the UAE, specifically Dubai and Abu Dhabi. So a walking distance from my house, there's an Anglican church. Um, there's a Mormon population that's there, uh, which surprised me. There's a whole lot of them, and they're all in the Boy Scouts right there um, in my kids' school. Um, there's tremendous uh, uh, religious tolerance, and it's, it, it again comes from I, the, who I mentioned earlier, Sheikh Zayed, who's known as the father of the country who developed it, who said, who gave land to different churches early, early on and said, we welcome you. Now, you're not supposed to proselytize and do all of, you know, try to convert people, but your community can worship the way that you worship here. Yeah, uh-huh. Do you have a language problem in Arabic? No, but I wish I could speak it. I'm trying very hard. It's incredibly difficult. Um, my 10-year-old, blah, 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 he's fine. Um, but the English is the language of business. All business is conducted in English. Now, there are certain, um, uh, formal protocols that need to be done in Arabic and informal Arabic and there are people who fill in and do those sorts of things but otherwise it is English and it's 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 a little it's a little disconcerting to me because it sometimes because everything's done in English it sometimes marginalizes the native population who doesn't have who don't have a strong English language background that they need it to be successful in their own country you know, kind of wish it wasn't that way, but but it is. So, mm -hmm. who's going next? Um, I had a <laughs> question. <laughs> oh, yeah. I had a question about. Um, I I was an ex uh, patriot, yeah. yeah, and living in the Netherlands, but I was ah. like your husband, the stay-at-home yeah. mm -hmm. person. But um, in the country where you are, uh -huh. they're not allowed to drink. No, okay. Alcohol so, is forbidden. So how do you? Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. So how do you how do you navigate? So so alcohol is not forbidden. Alcohol is only forbidden if you're Muslim. I am not Muslim, so I <laughs> I can drink. I can drink in hotels. I can drink in my house. There are liquor stores that I can go to. I can show you. I have a special liquor license. And it does limit the amount of money I can spend on alcohol each month. I, am, I can't spend more than 1,300 US dollars on alcohol per month. <laughs> so, so what do you do after Tuesday? <laughs> <laughs> very, very good, yeah. She's not in college yeah. <laughs> That's right. Mm -hmm. Uh, so with an economy that has risen up because of the oil revenues and created an environment with free health care, no taxes, et cetera, et cetera, what's the incentive for the population to want to become innovative because they all want to go to work for the government because they can retire in 15 years, 20 years, all those sorts of things. It sounds to me like it's there's going to be an implosion at some point it, uh, yeah. and, and the conflicting uh, needs for innovation versus this comfort level that the population feels in the current environment. Yeah, I th that's a really good point because it could be very, very easy to become very complacent there. Um, so it's, it's an issue of, I think, probably the government starting to decrease the number of job opportunities that are there and kind of force people into the private sector. And one of the things they've actually been doing is trying to find a way to um, subsidize the private sector to be able to offer more attractive benefits um, to recruit and retain um, an Emirati population. Um, but you hit the nail on the head, it's going to be, a, it's going to be an issue. Um, I mean, the good news is the population is so small that you don't end up running out of resources the way that you do in, in an Egypt or a Libya or a Tunisia where you start to see these major um, issues that are happening. Um, I don't know what the long-term solution will be, but it's absolutely something they, that obviously they need to be looking at. Now, a lot of the, the people that I work with who are young in their 20s and 30s, um, you know, because they went to school in the US or, or the UK or Europe, there's a certain drive in them, you know, they'd like to invent something, they'd like to be a Bill Gates, they'd like, you know, that prestige as well, but it's easy to just sit back and have a nice government job as well. Yeah. I guess a follow-up follow question would be, uh, what about the concerns about the 
unrest and upheaval in the other parts of the Middle East. I, I was spent seven months in the early 90s in the Middle East, mm. and some of the countries that are in complete upheaval now were much like Abu Dhabi yeah. was then with religious tolerance, etc. Mm -hmm. Yeah. which no longer exists because of Islamic fundamentalists. Yeah. Uh, so what's, what are the concerns of the Emirates about that coming, spilling over the borders and starting to impact the way of life? So I think there is a concern about it. And, um, and what the uh, leadership has done essentially is, uh, since the early uprisings, essentially be very, very visible. They've been on listening tours um, throughout the Emirates. They've been um, responding in terms of increasing infrastructure. I think in most of those countries, you know, it's Islamic fundamentalism is an issue, but the bigger issue is you have this huge youth population with no job opportunities. And so, you know, they can't feed their families and, um, and they have essentially nothing to do and no, nothing to look forward to. So um, Abu Dhabi and, and the rest of the Emirates are are focused on ensuring that their population, again, very small population, is happy and satisfied. One so, last question, and I saw uh, George's hand up. And then you can yeah. talk to me after. <laughs> yes. I, I'm wondering when you travel with young ladies uh -huh. from the Emirates, do they keep the national direction and they change on the plane before they go? Yeah, so they all change. They get 10 miles out and they all change. Um, so it is, it, it is interesting. They take the national dress off unless they're in the Gulf region. And sometimes even in the Gulf region they will because, um, or especially in the Levant, because um, the issues that you talked about earlier, it's unfortunate, but because Emiratis are seen as a wealthier group of people, they are, if they're in these countries, the target potentially of kidnap because large ransoms will be paid for them. Um, so they tend not to dress in, in local gear, in places where that could be an issue or where travel advisories have been announced. But most of the women that, well, it's split. Some of the women that I work with will still wear a hijab or cover their hair. And some, none. It's personal. Mm -hmm. You see you. Yeah. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Still the same thing. Yep, yep, still the same thing. And then, it, but again, it's in, it's individual. Some women like to keep their hair covered, and some don't. So, and probably depends on where they're going and who they're going with. Well, let's thank uh, Linda for a really insightful conversation. Oh, thank you. Thank you.